<coughs> so we'll see whatever we can cover. And as we go along, we'll also keep on... Uh, yeah, we do have quite a few slides, so let's go through it because there might be a few slides which are connected. So if you have questions, note it down. We will address it towards as we reach towards the end of the presentation. Okay. Uh, quickly, just to introduce ourselves. So, Tina. I am Tina Vinod, and I'm a diversity, equity, and inclusion strategist and consultant. And Shal, so I work at ThoughtWorks. And honestly, the reason why, uh, like since we have been working at ThoughtWorks for quite some time, uh, we have not been stranger to DEI. ThoughtWorks has kind of evolved with DEI being at its core. Uh, but ThoughtWorks also happens to be the pioneer in distributed agile. So we kind of invented it. And maybe or maybe not, for a very long time, we thought that there might be some correlation between agility and between DEI. Uh, what Tina and I have been doing is we have been working towards it, uh, or we have been trying to observe and find out certain things over the past uh, one year now. We have also published uh, three blogs so far around our observations. So if you go on ThoughtWorks Insights and you just search for DEI, one of our blogs will show up. <coughs> and what we have today are basically things that we have observed. So our observations captured on one presentation, right? So before we get into the entire aspect of DEI and agility, Maybe just a little brushing up of the core. So what's DEI? Want to start? Yeah, as humans, we are all very variable. Is my voice too loud? Is it OK? OK. Um, as humans, we are all have a lot of variability. Um, we bring different identities to the workplace. Um, you may look at me as a woman, but there are multiple identities to me. I'm a woman. I'm a mother. Um, I come, I care deeply about equity in the society. I'm a Tamilian, I'm a Catholic. So there are so many different nuances that are there to me as an individual and I'm sure to each one of us in the room. So that's the diversity. We don't really leave who we are and our identities outside of the workplace like a coat we hang outside and then come into our workplace. These are the identities that we carry to our workplace and that's the diversity. So let's say even when we staff teams and at ThoughtWorks, when we intentionally staff teams, we look at diversity, people coming from different backgrounds, genders, even experiences that they carry. And those are the mix that we put in the diverse teams that we intentionally staff, right? Inclusion? Inclusion is the effort to include. Um, inclusion is never a state, it's always a journey. So no organization, no team can at a given point be 100% inclusive because you constantly make efforts to include based on the diversity that's available within your organization or within your team. And one of the examples I can think of from inclusion standpoint is, let's say, using the right pronouns. Right? So you have team members. They might come from various different backgrounds. They have their pronouns. Just usage makes them feel more included. They belong to the group. Equity is leveling the playing field. We all know we don't all start at the same place. We have differences. It can depend on um, class differences, economical differences. It could be abilities. It could be how uh, divergent we are or neurodivergent we are. It could also be what type of education, background, religion, privileges that we've had. And so within the context of the workplace, you would see that equity plays a very, very important role when you level the playing field. But when you do not level the playing field, it can bring with it a lot of challenges. And that's precisely what we would look even when we are staffing teams. So people who come from different backgrounds, they might have some special needs and some ways of leveling or giving them the same opportunities. And that's what we work towards when it comes to equity. But going through why it matters. There's been a lot of research around diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially in the context of the workplace. Whether it's Gartner or HBR or any other big research forum, you would see that they've done some level of research on diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's also a big buzzword in the industry today, especially in the tech industry. You would see every organization talk about why it's important for the business. So whether you look at you know performance, whether you look at leadership capability, whether you look at um, innovation within teams, whether it, you look at your ability to hire diverse people or attract, you know, Gen Zers, for example, you would see that the, the organization's effort to bring in diversity, equity, and inclusion matters. Mm -hmm. So 
So now, good, we know it matters. When it comes to the relationship between agility and DEI, it's not very intuitive. It's not the first thing that comes to our mind. And we do look at it as being worlds apart. But when we start diving deeper into it and we start looking at the principles of DEI and agility, that's where the commonalities start coming out. Yep. So um, what does Agile have to do with DEI really? 17 middle-aged white men in a room who came up with the Agile manifesto and what do they have with DEI really? Uh, I, I'm still giving them a benefit of doubt. Because the very first value that they came up with was individuals and interactions over processes and tools. That statement alone made it people-centric. That's one of the principles of DIA as well. Absolutely. The very genesis, the very fundamental thing for diversity, equity and inclusion is its people, right? And in an organization or in a team, you would see that people form the crux of every outcome. And when people bring their authentic selves to work and you create a safe environment for, for them to bring their authentic selves to work, you would see that, that there is remarkable change in the organizational culture. And then let's talk about more principles. So there's another principle in, in the manifesto that says uh, developers and business people should work together every single day. Or the best results come from leaving people alone and letting them do what they're good at. And all of that points towards collaboration and collective ownership, be it any framework or the manifesto itself. DEI? So I'll talk about it with an example. If ThoughtWorks, if someone with a hearing impairment, very good candidate applies to ThoughtWorks, right? Or any organization, then the first most important thing is for your recruitment team to be sensitized, for them to understand what are the different things a person with a hearing impairment needs in terms of accessibility. How do you sensitize your interview panels? Once you hire the person and you bring them in, what type of accessibility tools do they need? What type of support do they need from the people function? How do you sensitize the, the tech team that they are going to be part of? Um, what reasonable accommodations do you give? So it is a massive collaboration and it is about collective ownership as well. Because no one individual can become responsible for, for that person's you know, progress or the, uh, their ability to perform to the fullest within a team. Mm -hmm. And then we talk about a bunch of things, continuous improvement, feedback, all of that, if you look at the manifesto or many frameworks like Scrum, for example, these are inbuilt. We basically work towards it every single day. We spend time to continuously improve. We hear back from the people, we listen to them about what are their needs and then we change and we change for good. That's precisely what we do in DEI as well. Absolutely. When we look at DEI, um, you would see that at no given time, are you perfect at what you do? Just let's take gender inclusion within the workplace. You may say, oh, we want, as an organization, we want to hire more women. But does it stop at hiring more women? You will have to look at the relook at your flexibility. You will have to relook at your policies. You will have to relook at your benefits. You will have to relook at unconscious bias and you will have to train your employees and you will have to build capability to understand unconscious bias and how it can impact the workplace. But most importantly, you'll need to offer psychological safety. And so all of this is something that requires continuous improvement, it requires flexibility, and it requires you to be adaptive to change. And then finally, we come to the empathy part of it. And anyone aware of XP by any chance, extreme programming? The very first principle with XP is humanity. People build software. People build software, you need to provide them with a safe space. The kind of appreciation that they want, the kind of needs that they fulfill, only then can they deliver what they are good at. That's where empathy comes into picture and I don't think the year is any different. Oh my God, it's very, very important. It forms the very crux of how you understand DEI within the workplace. Um, Empathy is something that starts not only um, at the leadership level, but trickles down to every individual within the organization. And it's very, very critical. And so 
understanding the fact that all of us come from different places, have different experiences, have had different privileges becomes very important. And hence, empathy needs to be interwoven into every practice within an organization. So good. With us so far, the principles are pretty similar. Hmm. <clears throat> there are still certain practices which consciously or unconsciously will result in excluding minorities in some way or the other. And these are agile practices that we are speaking about. Okay. Let's take a very simple example. Again, going back to the manifesto, the good principles. One of the principles states the best way to communicate is face to face. But someone who is blind or someone who has a hearing impairment, it's not the best way to communicate with them. Or let's talk about daily stand-ups. We use the term so frequently. Scrum still does a better job by calling it daily scrum or daily planning, whatever. Uh, but someone who has locomotive disability, stand-ups is not really very a good thing for them to hear. Or let's talk about retrospectives. If our way of improving is, say, let's say, doing some kind of a majority voting and then finding out items, how we improve, then there's a very good chance that we are going to leave out some minority votes. And that's going to matter. So there are agile practices which can still exclude certain groups. The Business Agility Institute recently did a survey on diversity, equity, and inclusion and a business agility. They spoke about the correlation, but they also spoke about some of the challenges and the pitfalls. Uh, ThoughtWorks India participated in that study and the survey. Uh, one of the key components, and that always sticks uh, with me, is um, this quote, Agile is on the spot, who can talk? I'm going to repeat that. Agile is on the spot, who can talk? And this is about extroverts. This is about people who can process information fast and can be very vocal about it on the spot. If you are an introvert, if you are neurodivergent, if you take time to process information, if you want to think before carefully before you share or you contribute, you will be excluded. And this is something that we will need to constantly watch out for. And this is just one of the many examples that are there. So that brings us to the notion that there is a need to rethink certain practices. And when we say rethink, rethink from a DEI perspective, from the lens of DEI. Um, so when we look at hiring, right, like I said, multiple identities, different people apply to an organization. All of them may not necessarily start at the same place. One simple example would be your job descriptions. Historically, it's seen that when job descriptions have certain words like aggressive, target-oriented, women do not mostly apply for these roles because these are masculine words. And there's a lot of research to make job descriptions gender neutral. So starting from your hiring practices to your onboarding practices, right? How do you onboard people? Do you keep the, the different factors around the organization? Are you only talking about the business details, but are, are you also talking about your organizational culture, your people practices? Are you talking about bias and microaggression? Are your policies reflecting that? Do you have a code of conduct? Do you have the right policies for sexual harassment and discrimination in the workplace to equal pay and opportunities, right? Are you look, doing pay parity checks within your organization? Are you looking at who gets advancement? Who gets that, that opportunity to travel abroad? And I will share an example here. A few years back, um, a, a business analyst in a team had to travel uh, to, uh, to UK for, for, um, to, for a client meeting. There were two business analysts on the project. One was a woman who was just back from a maternity break, and the other was a male business analyst. And, um, and the project manager, with all the goodness in, in his heart, said, oh my god, this woman's just back from a maternity break, so I'm just not going to ask her. I'm going to go ask the male uh, business analyst if he can travel for, uh, for uh, the client meeting. And when he asked the male business analyst, the person said, I can't travel. I have a personal commitment that I, have, that I need to be here for. He went back to the women and he said, hey, I'm really sorry to be asking you this. You've just come back on a maternity, from a maternity break, but can you, can you travel for this? Because it's a critical client meeting. She said, absolutely. Why didn't you ask me earlier? 
and I have a visa and I will definitely travel. She went, she met the client, she won extra work for the, for the project and for the team and she went back to travel and meet the client six months later. Good intention by the pro program manager but you need to overcome some of those biases that you carry in your head and, and these are certain things that come very, very unconsciously to us. We think we are doing the right thing but sometimes that needs to be questioned and challenged. Um, reverse mentoring, a lot of, many organizations do this well, many organizations don't. But having someone from the LGBTQ plus community, a junior person, mentor or leader, brings a vast difference in how the leader looks at cure inclusion in the workplace. The way they look at policies, they will, the way they look at behaviors, their behaviors themselves. Uh, performance reviews is another um, area, right, when we look at how we give feedback, um, who we give feedback to. How are we, the, the style in which we give feedback, is there a hierarchy mindset in our heads? And then finally, data-driven DEI, because if you look at data, it will actually tell you where you are making mistakes. What's your pipeline like? How diverse is your pipeline? Who is exiting the organization? Why are they exiting the organization? What is your attrition levels, right? And then finally, framing policies based on that data is very, very critical. So let's say we have spoken about a few things. This is one example. So Chris and Samson, they started sharing this uh, on LinkedIn uh, since a few weeks. This is something that I've done on my teams as well. So we speak a lot about DEI, but we need examples of how it comes, in to, uh, comes into play. This is a personal user manual. Uh, how should you interact with me <coughs> so that we work together the best? And every individual, let's say on my teams, we have created this in the past. Not so artistic because we are not very artistic, but we have created this in the past and we have put it up on the wall so that even for new joiners, this is like a part of their onboarding. And if we understand each other's preferences of how we work, then it automatically makes us more agile because we know what are the places where we need to be better at and that just removes all the hurdles that we want. I haven't tried this in hybrid or remote, uh, but I do understand that there are tools where we can utilize this. This is just one example how inclusion can affect your teams and just help them with the way they work and make them a bit more agile than they are. Do look it up on LinkedIn, uh, Chris Stone and uh, Stephen Sampson. So essentially what we are saying is that you wish to improve your agility, you want to be more agile, you need to embrace DI. There are quite a lot of examples where we state that agile practices can overlook these practices. But at the same time, if we are intentional about it, it can increase the agility. That's just the first thing. The question to ask is, how do we start? Do you know? Um, so there have been examples, right? So when organizations want to get agile, just following simple rituals is enough. We'll do a stand up, we will have a story wall, and we'll do some of these simple practices, and yeah, we're agile. Similarly, in DEI, you would say, hey, let's celebrate Women's History Month. This is March month, we're celebrating Women's Day. We will celebrate June as Pride Month. And we are, we care about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and this is what we do really well. Well, that we all know that's not true. There's so many different things that we will need to do to ensure that we strategically weave in DEI into the workplace. And one of the first steps towards that is to strategically weave it into your purpose and your value statement and your mission statement. And for this, you would see many organizations do this really well. There's Salesforce, there's Ben and Jerry's, um, there is Accenture who does a very, very good job. There's Publicis Sapient also who does a good job of weaving in their DEI message right into their purpose and their value statement. Mm -hmm. So we start with why, Simon Sinek, Golden Circle. Here's one example. Now ThoughtWorks, as we said, we have been looking at DEI for a very long time, but very recently we also revisited our purpose. And when we did that, this is the new purpose statement that came out with the five lenses and eight values that we carry. And one of those values is inclusivity. Now it's one thing to say that inclusivity is being added as a value. What's more important is how this exercise was conducted. This was one of those exercises which was not conducted in a boardroom. Globally, we had people who were invited for workshops 
There were workshops being run where their notion of ThoughtWorks were being heard. And from those inputs over a number of different iterations, this is what came up with. This is an example where every individual who was an employee of ThoughtWorks, their voice was heard while we were recreating the purpose statement of the organization. That's what defines inclusivity and that's what makes people believe in the purpose of the organization. They feel they are connected. We need some way to operationalize it. Yeah, like I said, just celebrating a few days in a month or celebrating a few days in a year or doing a couple of things is not enough to operationalize DEI. In organizations where I've seen it done well, and this is something that even in ThoughtWorks we have learned over the years, is that you will need to have the right infrastructure and the right investment and the right leadership commitment to ensure that DEI is operationalized within the organization. There's a very, very simple uh, figure here that talks about how business stakeholders, you need to have, if you're a global organization, you need to have a global council. If you have, and then you have to have regional councils, but it also needs to be integrated with your clients, markets, and external stakeholders, which could be your investments, if you're investors, if you're a public company. It also needs to be included and um, you know, uh, interconnected with your employee experience and your employee engagement. Simple things like running an employee survey will tell you how an employee is feeling within the organization. And if it's anonymous, it adds a lot more value. Your internal functions. And you may think, what has DI got to do with marketing? Or what does it have to do with staffing? Everything matters, right? Um, if I need, if I have recently, if I'm a new dad, um, I've recently had a baby, I may not want to be staffed in a project that, that's, you know, that's distributed in North America because I just want to be supportive of my spouse and be there for, for them and just want to be available. Um, so how you go about staffing also becomes, um, you know, something that DEI needs to look at. But overall practices I've seen in ThoughtWorks and some other organizations, but very few, the recruitment team, for example, following DEI practices superbly well. You would see story walls and you would see stand-ups, you would see the huddles, and you would just wonder how are they getting it all right without, without doing it like, you know, as part of their overall career journey. But basically, it's important to have, make the right investments. Many organizations do it, and this is not something that you have to look at in terms of uh, monetary investment. Sometimes it just means having the right intention to do it and making, leadership, uh, making the leadership commitment to do it right. So we know that we need to operationalize it. There has to be some connection with agility as well. Right? What I'm saying over here is that you cannot have an agile mindset unless you have inclusivity. One of the examples that I've always thought about is let's say there is an organization that's going through some form of transformation. And let's say that they have one of the goals. The goal is to reduce their time to go to production by 50%. In other words, if they take 10 days to go into production, they need to go in five. How do we achieve that? We go through the manifesto, we go through a bunch of frameworks, we'll say, okay, continuous integration and delivery might work. In order for continuous integration to work, there's something known as trunk-based development to work. As a part of trunk-based development, every single person in your team is basically committing the code to the production branch in layman terms, layperson terms. <laughs> and the very fundamental that you may have a junior person on the team or a new person who joined your team uh, today, will you trust them enough to push code into the production branch directly? It's not very easy. There might be some trust issues which means that you need to bring in the safety net for them. Some safety net could be that you'll have some rules against what happens when there's a red build. How do you roll back? Or do you have to pair with this person so that this person is comfortable enough to do this activity themselves? Because they might not have the confidence to do it either. But these are small things, small inclusive things that makes that person feels much more valuable to the team. This is one example of a practice that improves your agility because, hey, it's actually helping you go into production in half the time. So yeah, you can't have an agile mindset unless you have an inclusive mindset. It's as simple as that. 
many more examples like that. For now, at an organization level, Many of you all may have heard of the Vapasi program. Um, it's one of the programs that we're extremely proud of, so we just feel like everyone should know about it. Um, this is a women in tech returnee program that we have. And um, at ThoughtWorks, we have a goal to be 40% women and underrepresented gender minorities in tech by the end of last year, which was 2022. Why women and underrepresented gender minorities in tech? Because in tech, women are underrepresented. There's a lot of bias and discrimination that happens with sometimes naturally women opt out of tech roles, the bro culture, um, to name one of them. Uh, things are changing. We see a lot more inclusion in the tech sector today. Um, we reached this goal last year. We are about 40.4 um, now as we talk. But Wapasi, we realized that if you're going to make this a program that's just owned by the leadership team or the DEI team or the HR team, then this, the program is going to bomb. It's going to fail. So what we did was we made it something that everyone co-owns within the organization. So you would see that right from your employer branding exercise to referral programs, many of the people who are part of Wapasi are actually referrals from our employees. So these are women who've taken a break, want to come back to tech, but tech is so difficult to get back to after a break because of the ever-changing nature um, of tech. You would also see that the trainers for this program are thought workers. You would see that the staffing team, um, you know, when, the, when they go on to internship, you would see that the entire team comes together to be coaches, mentors, and to support them through the entire internship program. So when you make a program like this, the collective, make it a collective ownership effort, you would see a lot more effort. And you would also see a lot of level the playing field happening because people are invested in this in emotionally and invested in this from an organizational culture standpoint. So let's take a very simple example. When it comes to business agility, uh, quoting Eli Goldratt, the theory of constraints, you need to find the constraint you need to get rid of the constraint, and then you need to keep on repeating that. And the more you do, the more agile you become because your organization keeps on getting away from the constraint. One of the constraints we have is attrition. The more attrition we have in the organization, the more time it takes for recruitment, it's higher cost for onboarding, everything. If you can improve your retention, then all of that problem goes away, and then you can go ahead and utilize that energy into getting rid of the next constraint, which is what brings in the agility that we speak about. WAPSI and similar programs have a retention rate of 92%. This is an example where your business is becoming agile just because of this one program, which is a collective ownership of the entire organization. And it's focused towards including. Yeah. If I just may add on to, onto that as well, is one of the things we've seen is that we have a higher number of women at the junior level, but as the seniority goes up, you would see lesser women and more men in senior roles. And what, this, what happens then is that when you look at leadership positions, especially in the tech space, you have less women. So what this program does is bridge that gap because you're bringing senior technical women back and they, are, you know, they get accelerated in their careers very fast. So now these efforts are not possible bottom-up alone. So there's something that we need from leaders as well. We are saying the role of inclusive leaders is absolutely essential when it comes to business agility. Right? Yeah. Um, leaders have long shadows. So sometimes a leader does not realize how much of an impact and influence they have within their organization. Um, I'll just give you all a small example. In 2014, we hired our first trans woman. Um, she was part of the marketing team. And uh, when we did that effort, it was, it was huge because no one has seen a trans woman in the office before. And uh, Nayana, she's a TEDx speaker and very well known in the, in, in the tech circles today, um, used, to go to the to, used to go to the cafeteria to make tea somewhere around four, which is roughly around the same time our MD, Sudhir Tiwari, also used to visit, uh, you know, the, somehow they used to clash often. And uh, one day she came back and she said, Tina, you know how Sudhir just says hi and talks to me and checks on me. This, this was exactly her words. She said, I just feel so much part of the organization. 
and this is very small right when you walk in sometimes you don't even notice who's in the cafeteria and you may not want to talk as well you may just say you know that person is going around with making their cup of tea or coffee and you are you'll just finish your job and go away but just making that effort leaves such a big impact on on especially those who are underrepresented and marginalized so the role of a leader is huge when it comes to enhancing inclusion within the workplace so we being us we demand certain things from our leaders we say that leaders should be inclusive and care about equity as a strategic goal and that's thinking years ahead yeah and leaders should own and drive the executive sponsorship of dei they should lay the foundation for the governance and not only that the extended leadership team right from the organization's highest level of leadership to your project managers to your tech leads they need to be held accountable for inclusion and equity within your teams and this is very very important so yeah they will have to be empathetic leaders they'll have to create those leadership teams and these teams will basically cascade till through the next level and the next level till it reaches the last level in your organization that's what makes a complete inclusive organization for everyone and then the last one leaders need to engage with dissent and be able to communicate it appropriately um i just spoke about the 40% women and underrepresented gender minority goal so one of the things we first came up with as a mandate is at the grad level we will hire 50% girls and 50% boys from tech colleges and when we made this a mandate a lot of people came back and said hey i'm worried are you all in any way reducing uh, the bar when it comes to hiring women technologists how are you going to go find those women and we had to make it very and this was dissent and it was coming to us in different ways right from people participating as interviewers in in uh, you know I, when we go for campus recruitment and this had to be addressed in a very open and inclusive way and so what we did was we spoke about how we are not in any way you know tampering with the assessments or relooking at our hiring hiring policy or our hiring approach but what we are doing is we are going to a lot more colleges and we are hiring more women and sometimes this led to a lot more diversity because we've gone to colleges in northeast we've called gone to cities where we have not gone before including tie to and tie three cities but the most important thing here was when you engage with dissent especially when leaders engage with engage with dissent you will see a lot more collective participation whether it is business agility or whether it is dei within the organization a, a very simple example is when we speak about dysfunctions of a team artificial harmony is a dysfunction so conflicts are necessary engaging with dissent is precisely that so that's one way of getting rid of your dysfunction and that is what enables agility even further so moving on yeah so um this is something i personally very proud of the amount of effort we've done in the cure inclusion or the lgbtq plus inclusion space way back in 2014 when um um uh, you know same sex was decriminalized um the the mds of thoughtworks wrote an open letter that's still there on our website um talking about how this really pulls back everything that thoughtworks stand that i'm sorry not thoughtworks but india stands for um which is about diversity which is about inclusion and being um equitable to all um take that a few years later we hired more people from the lgbtq plus inclusion we hosted our first interning with pride program uh which is very similar to wapsi but it is an internship uh it's a training internship and hiring program for people from the queer community or the lgbtq plus community um what does this do a lot of people in india probably people attending this conference as well who are from the queer community but who are not out and open and this provides a safe space for them they may not come out but they know that the organization cares and so you would constantly see that doing this provide psychological safety but it also creates inclusion in much much larger ways another example for this is there was a book that uh, that was written about allyship journeys within organ within people right how do you move from being someone who does not care about lgbtq plus inclusion and how do you move to be an ally 40 people wrote this uh, wrote their stories and it's a book that's available in the market on allyship 
My daughter was one of them who wrote, and she was just in the eighth grade then. And she wrote about her story of allyship, and how did she hear about that story of allyship? Because me as an individual, I'm taking, I'm not only doing this as part of my job in ThoughtWorks, but I'm also taking, taking it back home with me. And that is how you not only build equitable workplaces, but you end up influencing the society at large. So essentially, safety as a prerequisite. We are not even the first ones who are saying that. This is something that even modern agile mentions. If you go on their website, Josh Okuleski has been speaking about this for a very long time. But you need safety. People need to feel safe. They need to have privacy of their data, their health. And this is what leads them to do their best work. So when you make safety as a prerequisite, then a lot of things happen. At the team level, one of the things that we've noticed and we've realized early on is if you have homogeneous teams, it will lead to groupthink. Right? You have the same set of people from the same set of college who worked in the same set of projects. If it's very homogeneous, you don't really understand the needs. And there are so many examples. I don't know if we'll have the time to talk about it. Uh, where we've seen that homogeneous teams don't really innovate and, and, um, you know, and the outcomes aren't as great as they should be. Um, so it's very important from, uh, to look at inclusive rituals, inclusive practices. It's important to build psychological safety because when there is psychological safety, you take risks. And this is also proven uh, by a lot of research. It also, when you ask, when you are someone who needs accessibility, you will ask for it because you have that psychological safety. And you will also learn as a community. I have seen massive learning uh, that happens about so many topics, especially one example is during the pandemic. None of us used to talk about mental health and well-being in the workplace. Um, I remember after the pandemic, the amount of effort organizations are putting in to talk about mental health and well-being within your teams, in the workplace has become so much more. But we started that journey even before that in 2019. And so it's so important, not only from a team standpoint, but even when leaders talk about their mental health challenges, it can be something as simple as anxiety. Um, and all of us went through this during the pandemic. And so I think it just not only makes us more human, but it also creates a space for us to innovate and share. Um, so investing in a culture of cultivation where we invest in each other, but also to overcome our unconscious biases. I think unconscious biases are something that we are so unconscious about. Um, uh, you know, we were just talking about it before we, we came in here, and uh, we said we definitely should address unconscious bias and talk about how it impacts us in the workplace. Yeah, we'll probably not have the time to get into everything, but we are available after the talk. But let's say there's one thing that unconscious bias is so common, but we do not know about it. This is a very recent example. Chat GPT, like it's trending right now. This company, Textio, they actually asked for uh, feedback around certain job descriptions from ChatGPT. This is what ChatGPT assumed their gender to be based on the profession. So biases exist. And the thing is that if we hold these biases, unconscious biases, in our product development teams, then we end up building these in the products as well. So it's important to address this because if we don't, then we are just making our tech as stupid as us, even though this is artificial intelligence, I'm just, don't quote me on that. But yeah, that's the truth. So. Um, during the pandemic and a little after that as well, one of the things that we realized is that we've been hiring a lot of people. Um, they've been joining remotely. We haven't been, we've been able to do a lot of onboarding, but still, you know, team practices and shared understanding of the, what those team practices need to be were constantly evolving. And so together, the DEI team and the tech team came up with the inclusive team social contract. I spoke about this in the Agile India 2021 conference. Uh, yes, 2021. Uh, but basically, it's an exercise to relook at your ways of working, but look at four important parameters. That is an exercise that's facilitated by someone outside of the team and outside of the project. Some of the challenges that the teams were having and were facing is that how do you connect and communicate with each other? Especially in hybrid teams, when some people are working face-to-face -face and the others are working remotely, how do we ensure certain privileges are not given to certain groups and certain privileges are withheld from certain groups, right? How do you ensure there's no group think? Um, today, I was also talking about um, you know another example, but, but a very valid example was the smoking, you know, that, that the chai tapri smoking. 
the, the smoking that men do outside and some of the important decision makings that happen over there and then get uh, translated onto teams internally. Maybe it happens today, maybe it doesn't. But we know these biases and these practices exist. And how do we challenge some of these practices is something that's very important. So just to wrap everything up, we're also close to the end, I think. Uh, this is one of the quotes by Jim, who's been a long-time thought worker, also the signatory of the Agile Manifesto. At the core of healthy team relationships is trust and respect. DEI for us is a way to achieve that. And if we have this in place, then agility is just a sensible outcome. You know? Yeah. We've often heard this term, culture eats strategy for breakfast. I'm sure everyone's heard it. But what is culture? Culture is meaningless without the adjective that comes with it. Culture is, is it an inclusive culture? Is it a culture of belonging and care? Is it a culture of respect? So a lot of times, the culture, the word culture itself is meaningless if you do not add the right adjectives to it. And so it becomes the responsibility of every individual within the organization to own that culture and ensure it trickles down to everything that we do from our people practices to our agile practices. Thank you. That is the end, but this is still a work in progress. So we are still working on a lot of things. Uh, I do uh, ask you to go and check out the insights blogs that we have written so far, but there's still more that's going to come. And we just hope that we can take this to a good strategic end, only to give a good strategic start. Right? Thank you so much. Thank you. I know we are out of time, but it's okay if we have questions, we can always take it. As in not here, but it's fine. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It was really wonderful. We can still take questions if anyone has. Hi, my name is Vipin. Uh, my question is um, pre pandemic, post pandemic, hybrid on-site, remote, all types of work is there. How did the DEI strategies change or improvised in ThoughtWorks during all these models or periods? in our lives. So it did change. But I think what's most important is to understand how do you adapt to that change in the context of DEI. So it was difficult. So we had to relook at the way we engage and the way thought workers or our employees are experiencing the organization. One thing that we realized was really helping us is uh, the surveys that we did. We have an annual survey on DEI and engagement that we run. It's an anonymous survey. And it, is, it can really be sliced and diced into multiple data. So I can actually, and it's anonymous, so if, if only if more than five people answer, will that data be seen by others. And so that data gave us a lot of um, ideas around what's the roadmap that we need to take for our next steps. But it's been difficult. I have to be honest, it's not been easy. And even with hybrid, there's a lot that happens in terms of unconscious bias, right? What are some of the privileges that people who come to office get over the people who don't come to office? And so these are things that you constantly work in progress. That's why I said inclusion is always a, is never a state, but it's always a journey. I think just to add, the strategies might, might have changed. But the principles, the guiding principles were still there, and that basically helped us de-strategize whatever we have. Uh, but there are a few things which are also in the works. Like I keep on speaking about async agile, which will come out as a book in a few days, and Sumit, one of our colleagues, has been speaking about it. There are, there, that's one of the ways how we can address a lot of these systemic issues. So yeah, if you want to take a look at it, just go on the Async Agile website. Thanks. You good? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.